Hello, welcome to this video, and on this video I will be going through my 10 favourite jazz rock fusion albums from 1974. So we've just entered into a new year, haven't we? So happy new year to you all. Um, and this month my mind always goes to albums that will be becoming 50 years old. 50 years old. This is an incredible thing. If you go back 50 years to 1974 and then we think of being in 1974 and looking back 50 years to 1924, how many albums would pe people have been talking about back in 1974 that were 50 years old? Hardly any. Perhaps, um, I don't know, some of the Louis Armstrong recordings. <laughs> you know, so I don't know. Um, hardly any. But here we are 50 years later talking about these incredible albums. And there's an audience out there that wants to still hear people's opinions about them and you know discuss their merits which is an incredible thing so um, this week I'm going to be doing three videos one looking at my favorite jazz rock fusion albums one looking at my favorite prog albums another video where I'm going to look at my top five sort of rock albums and my top five funk albums and I'll tell you why I've done it like that when we get to those videos later in the week but on this one we're just going to be talking about jazz rock fusion so let's set the scene. Um, 1974 is a strange year for progressive music. Um, if you see the progressive movement, including jazz rock, psychedelic rock, classic rock, all these bands have emerged in the late 60s, and there's been an explosion, you know, sort of um, powered by Sgt. Pepper to create more outlandish music for which there's a market and these albums are selling a lot. Uh, the record companies start to push progressive rock albums and they start to push jazz rock albums. The Bad Vision Orchestra emerges in 1971, sells a lot of records and the record in, recording industry is interested in pushing uh, money into these albums. Now um, if we look at progressive rock we can see by 1974 the cracks are starting to show and I think that sums up this year very well. 74 is for me ground zero. I've been uh, listening to um, Stephen Wilson and um, Tim Bonus's uh, excellent album years podcast. I've become a huge fan of it. And uh, they will um, describe 1977 as ground zero. So that was the time when sort of culture realized the follies of all this progressive outlandish stuff. But I think um, the musicians knew that before. And in 1974, you're actually having to scrap around to find um, classic prog and classic rock albums that um, are equal to the albums in 1973. With jazz rock, it's not like that. Jazz rock has still got a momentum. And so we have a list of absolutely classic albums. And when you go through these albums, you also feel like some of these albums are still there's a future there, there's a vision there still, we're still going somewhere. Um, so <clears throat> I'm going to kick off now and go through them. Uh, this is obviously a completely subjective list, as you've seen the title. These are my favourite albums. This isn't, there's loads of fusion albums that came out that uh, I'm personally not so keen on or they didn't mean so much to me and they won't make this list. Um, so as I go through this, I'm going to try and just discuss the legacy more than anything else. The legacy which has um, motivated me to still talk about these albums 50 years later and for you to be listening. So, shall we start at number 10? So, at number 10, I have Get Up With It by Miles Davis. Uh, Miles Davis, at this point, is at the end of his sort of 70s electric period where he's, he's produced some real masterpieces. Um, by 1975-76 he will withdraw hermit-like into obscurity um, and everyone will be wondering what happened to him. Um, Get Up With This I think is the last studio album of the Electric period. Um, he also released Big Fun in 74 which is an absolutely classic album but that is pulling together sessions that went um, that happened around Bitches Brew so I haven't included that. Get Up With It, for me, is not one of the great albums from his electric period, but it's still an incredible album. Legacy-wise, we have to mention the sidelong half-hour 
epic called uh, He Loved Him Madly, which was um, Miles Davis's tribute to Duke Ellington. Duke Ellington had passed away in 1974. Uh, Lou Armstrong had passed away in 1971. So those two great architects of jazz were now gone. Um, and that's what I feel with this year. It's a very transitional year. Um, on He Loved Him Madly, Miles um, takes another approach, almost going back to the sort of in a silent way approach where it's much calmer and ethereal and it's very minimal. Um, the reason why I say this is a really important track is because when Brian Eno heard this track, he could hear that there was something new in it. It was the staticness. It was the music acting as almost um, an ambience in the room. Are you supposed to listen to this music or is it just supposed to operate in the background whilst you do something else? And from there Eno uh, came up with this idea of ambient music directly from this track. Um, if we look at the music scene now, that idea that Miles Davis had on that track is all pervasive. The idea of background music, the idea of ethereal music, you know, if you're playing a computer game and you're walking around a certain area, there's music playing in the background. I think you're playing Minecraft. All the soundtrack to Minecraft is directly related back to this track, He Loved Him Madly. There's also an incredible track on here called Rated X, um, which is, is almost anticipating things like jungle and drum and bass. Um, that got a remix by Bill Laswell on the Inamarata album. And it's that with the new production, because I think the problem with these electric albums is the engineers didn't quite understand Miles' concept. They didn't understand how to mix this. They were still mixing lead instruments up high rather than going into the bass and the ambience and pushing that up. Anyway, so that's what I've got number 10 is Get Up With It with Miles Davis. A great album, not one of the best electric albums, but still an incredible album. Um, at number nine, I, I have Like Children. 1974 had seen the dissolution of the original Mahavishnu Orchestra and Jerry Goodman and Jan Hammer, that it seems had been at loggerheads with John McLaughlin over composer credits. You know, they wanted to write uh, their own music and they wanted the Mavish Norkshire to feature these, um, these compositions. Now, what's very interesting listening to Like Children is that their compositional approach that they've developed is really in the style that John McLaughlin had innovated in the Mavishnu Orchestra. Um, Billy Cobham raised this in the recent interview I did with him. Um, and I wonder whether this could well be the case, that um, it wasn't necessarily the fact that they wanted to bring compositions in. It was maybe the fact that they'd taken on a compositional style that was based upon John McLaughlin, which of course would have happened out of a deep respect for John's incredible vision. When we put Like Children on, it's a, it's a strange album this is. Um, it's been created by Jerry Goodman and Jan Hammer entirely. They're playing all the instruments. Jan Hammer's on keyboards and drums. Um, there's a lot of program bass. There's some electric bass and electric guitar played by Jerry Goodman. And of course, Jerry Goodman's incredible violin playing. This album is in sound like the Mavish Orchestra, but in the sort of spiritual dimension it's the absolute opposite of the Mavish Norkshire. This is a very knowing sort of streetwise album made by people that were in their early 20s and so there's a different take on it. It's also very experimental in terms of Jan Hammer's um, incredible production approach and also the way he's utilizing keyboards. There's some incredible stuff on here uh, there's one piece where it's just like a, a, a very early sequence of triggering the Moog and he's soloing over the top. I think it's quite incredible. So um, that's what I've got number nine is Like Children, an essential purchase if you're a fan of the Mavish Orchestra. At number eight, I have Introducing the Eleventh House. And I think this is what we see in 1974, is that a number of jazz artists that had come up in the 1960s trying to um, integrate rock with jazz um, and not always entirely succeeding have now heard the Mavish Nuxtra and they're all scrabbling to form bands in the style of the Mavish Nuxtra. Larry Coriel who 
could be described as one of the main architects of jazz rock fusion is in the process of doing this and so he forms a band called the 11th house now i think the 11th house was a, a sort of reference to astrology so he's tried to bring in this sort of cosmic element into the group he's formed this incredible band with alphonse musen on drums who's jumped ship from weather report which was formed in 1971 as a super group and is much more conducive for alphonse musen to do his sort of um explosive high energy drumming got Randy Brecker on trumpet and the great blind keyboardist uh, Mike Mandel who like Jan Hammer is an, another synthesizer pioneer um, introducing 11th house is one of the great jazz rock albums it's incendiary it's over the top uh, it's out of control the playing is incredible and I've always loved Larry Coriol's guitar playing and I think he's incredibly underrated um, I think he gets um, compared to Aldi Miola and John McLaughlin um, and in that it comes off that and many Jazz Rock Future fans seem as being not quite the virtuoso of those guys. He was an incredible virtuoso. If you put Larry Coriel up against any of the other 70s guitarists like Jimmy Page or Eric Clapton or Richie Blackmore, he would blow them out of the water. The guitar playing is incredible. And um, he brings in aspects from country music and Americana um, with a true understanding of that, a true understanding of sort of the Americanization of of rock music uh, which I find really compelling it's a fantastic album that's what I've got at number eight on my list at number seven I have the second album by Headhunters Thrust um, I love Herbie Hanc Hancock's Headhunters I love the funk and I've championed the first album which is just simply called Head Headhunters I champion it a lot um, but I love Thrust just as much that drum groove, the incredible drum groove that brings in palm grease, that signature, you know, beat, you know, is absolutely incredible. Um, this is, a, a um, in a way, a more exploratory album than the first Headhunters album. Um, and I think when we get to things like Actual Proof, on that, Herbie Hancock, with the sort of hits and the runs and the complexity of that head, opens up a way of playing jazz rock fusion that's going to be really influential. When somebody sends me some YouTube jazz rock sensation now, and you've got some band of people trying to play jazz rock and they're doing it really well, it's really incredibly competent, that, that thing we see all the time. They often aren't channel, channel, um, channeling the Mavish Noxia, they're cha channeling a sort of mixture of jazz rock and funk that's come through the Brecker Brothers which I think really has its um, genesis in that track actual proof that's a very important track um, so that's what I've got number seven is Thrust by Herbie Hancock and number six we have another one of these albums of you know a, a, a 1960s jazz artist hearing the Mavish Nocturne and wanted to get in on the game. It's of course uh, Return to Forever. Chick Corea um, in the early 70s, his idea of fusion was a fusion between um, jazz and Latin music and the first two, weather, um, sorry not weather but the first two Return to Forever albums explore that vein. Then he hears the Mavish Nocturne and in 1973 he pulls this incredible um, band together um, called to Return to Forever on the first time we've got Bill Connors, Lenny White, uh, Stanley Clark and um, Chick of course on keyboards and synthesizers not so much on the first album but on this album that comes in 1974 the second album by the sort of fusion Return to Forever which is called Where Have I Known You Before we see the integration of the Moog synthesizer into the sound um, this is um, more controlled than the first album it's more reliant on classical motifs, although the first album has that as well, but this is a lot more composed. We start to see the input of uh, Lenny White's compositions and the input of uh, Stanley Clark's compositions. These, of course, are going to become two very important composers in their own right in terms of jazz rock. And we see the emergence in 1974 of a 20-year-old virtuoso guitarist called Aldo Miola who just comes and just blows everybody away on this album. Um, 
This is an incredible album. Again, it's in your face. It's this Sendry. It's absolutely incredible. Um, if you're going to get sort of 10 jazz rock albums, you would need to get him to the seventh galaxy you would need to get romantic warrior and you would need to get this album and probably no mystery as well they're they they're, they're incredible albums um for many people this is their favorite return to forever album and on a certain day it's mine as well it's there's certain moments in this where they are just off the charts in your face flying so um let's move on so that was at number six at number five I have the first of two albums by this artist. This guy made two classic jazz rock albums in 1974. And this one at number five is Total Eclipse by Billy Cobham. So Billy Cobham leads the Mavish Noxious 73. He makes uh, Spectrum with Tommy Bowling on guitar, Jan Hammer on keyboards, uh, Leila Sklar on bass. It's an incredible album. It's one of the great jazz rock albums. When I did my top 100 jazz rock albums, I put it at number two. It's a groundbreaking album. Uh, I don't feel that Billy gets the uh, acknowledgement as an artist, as a composer, but he has created absolute classic jazz rock tracks. Total Eclipse does not get mentioned in the same breath as Spectrum. This is the, the band he formed in 1974 that goes back to the band he had before the Mavish Nuxture, which was Dreams, which was very horn-led. So this is very horn-led jazz rock fusion this is anticipating you know groups like the brecker brothers and it goes back to groups like chicago and uh, blood sweat and tears um cobham's integration of the brass into a sort of jazz rock sound is sublime it's incredible um the this takes as a sort of concept the idea of interstellar space it's it's got the sound of space in it and the opening track which is a, a, it, it's, it's in like a sweet form and goes through stuff that sounds almost like modern classical music almost like return to forever we've got um incredible blowing there's there's drum solos Cobham is absolutely at his peak total eclipse for me is an absolute masterpiece um michael brecker randy brecker they come to the fore here. The soloing from those guys, especially for Michael Brecker, is some of the most incredible improvisation within this genre. It's an absolutely mind-blowing album. Um, and as I've said, I think the legacy of these albums that I'm going to be discussing, because we'll be getting to another one in a minute, the, this idea of the sort of intensity, rock Hendrix intensity of the Mavish Doctor paired with a, a, a brass section, taking the ideas from those uh, late 60s, early 70s um, jazz rock brass led groups. Here Cobham just pushes it to the max. It's full on. And um, the thing I've always liked about this album is the production is absolutely incredible. And um, there is just so much open soloing. They just blow, it's mind blowing. Um, and it's funky as well, really, really funky. That's what you always get with the Billy Cobb. You always get incredible riffs and the funk. So, uh, essential album if you're a jazz rock fan. At number four, I have, <coughs> from Weather Report, Mysterious Traveller. Weather Report for the 1971, as I said before, as a super group. They've got Marissa Lavitas on um, double bass, Wayne Shorter on saxophone, Joe Zow on, on electric piano. Uh, and Alphonse Mouze on, on drums and Ayatu on percussion. And they come in with a sort of post Miles Davis um, sort of space jazz sound. It's actually quite exploratory. It's, it, it doesn't have the immediacy that some of the other jazz rock groups have. Okay? Um, Zawanon slowly takes control of the band. So rather than being a co cooperative, he takes control and he he, this incredible relationship he's got with Wayne Shorter and those are the sort of primary um, composers in that group they start to develop um, they, you really see that compositional approach come in on I, I Sing the Body Electric which is an incredible album and then on Sweet Nighter we see the funk arrive and we see the rock arrive um, but we still don't hear that sound that we associate with Weather Report which is going to go on in, in three years time to produce one of the biggest selling albums in jazz 
heavy weather which is going to open up a sort of uh, disco-fied version of jazz rock you know which we then see emerging into all that sort of fusac thing um, on mysterious traveler we start to hear the beginnings of that but this is a heavy album it's got some of Zawadol's best compositions Alfonso Johnson is all over the place you know I know we always give the credit to uh, Jacko Pastores but Alfonso Johnson's playing on this is absolutely incredible and his bass Bass riff on Cucumber Slumber is just absolutely sublime. Uh, this, for me, is where Weather Report have arrived and they have their sound and they're going to explore that sound, you know, and it's a wonderful sound. So that's what I've got at number four is Mysterious Traveller by Weather Report. At number three, we have another album by Billy Cobham. It's the album I grew up with that was in my dad's collection that I discovered at the age of around about 12 or 13 uh, and uh, introduced me to this idea of jazz rock. It is, of course, Crosswinds. Is it any better than Total Eclipse? Probably not. It's just it's got such a special place in my heart, uh, this album has. Um, in that, as a sort of young drummer listening to Rainbow and White Snake and Motorhead to hear this album and hear what was possible on drums just blew me away it's uh, incredible the production's absolutely beautiful it benefits by having George Duke as well on keyboards who is incredible we've got obviously Randy Brecker John Abercrombie on um, uh, guitar we've got Michael Brecker um, I think there's a guy called John Williams on bass. He was replaced by Alex Blake. Anyway, this album, Side One, is a, a, a sidelong epic in a sweet form. And whereas Total Eclipse explores this idea of space, this side explores the idea of, of, of the weather, of storms, of rain. It's a little bit like Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony in that regard. And this complements precisely Billy Cobb's storm-like drumming. It starts off, it's a very mellow album in certain places, this sort of almost like Latin American sound. Incredible use of time signatures on this album, uh, on side one. We're getting here in time signatures like 1716. Uh, it's got some beautiful um, ballad writing, like Spanish Moss and Heather, are both incredible ballads that you wouldn't associate with an incendiary drummer like Billy Cobham. Um, his drum solo, which I think is called Storm, is wonderful because rather than showing off his chops, he, through the use of the, the, his big drum kit and the toms and the use of flange, paints a picture of a storm approaching. And then the storm is followed up by a flash flood. And flash flood is one of the most out there jazz rock pieces ever written. Flip this album, album over and we get hit by the funk. Pleasant Pheasant, which I think contains the greatest drum solo of all time and one of the greatest saxophone solos of all time. It's funky, it's in your face, one of the great jazz rock tracks. Then we get the aforementioned Heather, which has a beautiful Michael Brecker solo. And it almost feels like Michael Brecker is walking into the room as that solo. And then it finishes up with Crosswings, another slice of funk with an incredible John Abercrombie. Um, guitar solo on it so that's what I've got at number three is Crosswinds at number two I have an album that for me is so important in the annals of jazz rock history it is Stanley Clark's self-titled second album this album is incredible for me that as I said jazz rock is it, 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 it's it's at its peak and we have these ideas that are coming in from you know, Weather, Weather Report, Mavish, Orchestra, uh, Return to Forever. There's a certain sound here. And on this album, Stanley Clark puts a band together, which I think is one of the greatest jazz rock groups of all time. And it's the only time we ever hear this band. It's Stanley on bass, Jan Hammer on keyboards, Bill Connors, who was the guitarist on the first Weather Report album, and it's sort of going to disappear from view. So this is the this is the other album we go to to have our face taken off by Bill Collins' incredible guitar playing. And on drums, we have the, the master, the father of all this, Tony Williams, and Tony Williams is all over the place. The album sounds raw, it sounds lively, 
composition is incredible. Stanley Clark has, has, has discovered the electric bass and he's slapping it and doing all this sort of stuff. He's also playing double bass and he's sort of almost playing like flamenco on double bass. Um, Tony Williams solos, Jan Hammer solos all over it, Bill Connors solos all, all, all over it. It's incredible. We get a thing called Life Sweet at the end, which is this big, sweet, like um, progressive rock influence track that just ends in the most incredible Bill Connors guitar solo. This is a masterpiece. And it's the only time we ever heard this band. If this band had kept going, God knows what we would have had from this. Anyway, why nobody saw that in the record company, I don't know. Anyway, at number one, I have Apocalypse by the Mavish Norkstra. So the original Mavish Norkshire had um, uh, finished in 1973. John McLaughlin was pushing to it becoming a real orchestra and having, um, you know, uh, the sound of an orchestra. So this album is epic in its scope. Um, it's recorded in, I think, Air Studios with George Martin producing. Uh, we've got uh, Mike Gibbs arranging McGoughlin's compositions for the London Symphony Orchestra. We've got Michael Tilson Thomas conducting, and we have this new Mavish Norkshire with Ralph Armstrong on bass and Narada Michael Walton on drums. It's the in introduction to the world of Narada Michael Walton, and I think it's one of the, it's possibly the greatest introduction of a drummer onto the scene ever. This album is epic. It was recorded all at the same time utilizing the genius of George Martin. It integrates orchestra, it's got vocals on there, and um, it's got some incredible soloing. John McLaughlin really plays on this. His sound is different, it's more liquid, and it suits the other superstar solos that they've got on this album, which is Jean-Luc Ponty. This album is a masterpiece. It's, it, it, it's um, a complete follow-up of the original Mavish Nuxtra. Why wasn't it absolutely massively successful? Because for me, there's moments on here which are beyond what the original Ma Mavish Nuxia did. I know you shouldn't say that, but there's moments where the vision and the sound, that dark depths that you hear on tracks like Dance and Maya, are, are pushed to the limit on Apocalypse. Um, it really needs re-evaluating, this album does. I think it's an absolute masterpiece. Um, George Martin um, felt that Smile of Beyond was one of the best um, pieces of music he ever produced. And there's an incredible video where they did a biography of George Martin where he sits and plays it and he's almost in tears. It's an incredible achievement. So that there is my 10 favourites. And they're ranked, they're ranked. Uh, my 10 favourites jazz rock albums from 1974 or albums that will be celebrating their 50th anniversary this year so if you enjoyed this little trip down memory lane then please put a like on and subscribe if you want to really get involved with what i'm doing then become a patron it's not just extra content there we are involved we're meeting up i'm meeting up with the patrons that they're, they're getting involved in creating stuff all sorts of things we're bringing in more and more all the time i'm really enjoying patreon at the moment and if you don't want to do that but you want to support me i have a paypal tip jar stick a little bit of money in this is the year where this channel goes through the roof i've decided so I need your support, you know, we need new cameras, we need to be able to edit stuff, I need a new laptop, because my laptop blew up uh, this week. <laughs> so uh, don't expect all, all my brilliant video editing, because I haven't got a video editor at the moment. I've gone back to how the channel started, this is gonna be raw. I might try and use iMovies to stick a bit of some pictures of the album covers in for you. Yeah, well, I'll do, I'll do a bit for you, I suppose. But if you want me to do more, put, it, put a little bit of money in on PayPal, tip John. And those of you who do, I thank you very much. Thank you for watching and I'll see you on the next video.